Yep, there we go. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the um, session, Going Beyond Pounds, Measuring Your Impact and Why It Matters. Food recovery organizations tend to talk about pounds rescued, but even when we talk about meals distributed, it really only scratches the surface of the real impact that food recovery has. In this session, we're gonna hear from three researchers on how they asked and answered the question, what's the real impact of food recovery? You'll also hear how you can find uh, and work with researchers in your community to answer these big questions. We are gonna start off with a video, Melinda Angelis, who did some research um, using GIS for 412 Food Rescue in Pittsburgh. She could not be here um, today, but she's presented this research at a number of national um, conferences and we thought it was really exciting. So we're gonna go ahead and show a video from her. Patrick, if you wanna hit go on the video. My name is Melinda Angelis, and I'm so excited to join this virtual stage with Grace and Catherine. But unfortunately, I have another conference I have to attend, so I can't join you live. But Sean Hudson from 412 Food Rescue is conducting this year's impact report and is available to answer any questions on my behalf. And I'll have my contact information at the end if you'd like to contact me directly. Just to give you a little background on myself, when I started working for Allegheny County in 2015, a local government entity that includes the 412 area in Pittsburgh, I joined this county sustainability team and I heard a talk from a new initiative called 412 Food Rescue. After that, I immediately volunteered in any capacity I could, starting with designing some of their first marketing materials to becoming a regular food rescuer on foot and eventually helping out with our 2021 impact report. So here's what you should expect in the next 10 minutes or so. I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, you'll understand the goals, general concepts, and methodology that I used in their impact report, decide if it's appropriate for organization and me messaging, and get some tools to help you find someone that can replicate what I did. So what's the real meaning of impact? 412 Food Rescue's website states that they fight food waste, fight hunger, and protect the environment. How can you measure these goals in terms of output versus outcomes? The weight of food saved, the number of meals that were delivered to the community, pounds of greenhouse gases mitigated, the amount of water saved from having to generate more food. You can take the route of evaluating your impact by quantifying the outcomes of your organization, or you can try forecasting your impact and calculate the value created from your outcomes. There are so many ways to look at 412 Food Rescue's impact, but luckily for me, the methods I use in this impact report were already created and used just three years prior. 412 Food Rescue took the route of evaluating the number of recipients that may have taken advantage of their programming and compared this population to the ones that are potentially saved by existing networks like food banks. Among that population, they looked at three possible attributes, poverty rate, if that person lives in a food desert, and or if that person lives in a transit desert. If that person happens to fall under all three factors, that person is characterized as a high-risk individual. These first two factors of poverty and located in a food desert are typically related to food insecurity. But it is important to remember that a lack of transportation compounds the challenges of poverty. Not only does a lack of transportation or mobility prevent individuals from accessing grocers and food resources that could be relatively nearby, but also many food assistance resources, like food pantries, have limited hours, and individuals in need may have jobs that keep them occupied during these hours. So a lack of transit access is considered a third vitally important aspect of food insecurity. By looking at these three factors across the whole study area, 412 Food Rescue could determine the high need communities that should be prioritized in terms of programming and partnerships. Since I don't have much time to go into details, I'm gonna go over these methods at a high level. We could compare 412 Food Rescue's reach to traditional Food Rescue's reach by using walk sheds, meaning the area within a defined walking range of a location. So I found population data using the most recent American Community Survey, or ACS numbers, and distributed appropriately over the study area. 
Then I calculated 15 minute walk sheds around four and two food rescue partners and traditional food access network entities, including food banks, soup kitchens, and food pantries. Then I calculated the estimated population that lives within these walk sheds. This allowed us to compare estimated outreach numbers between the two entities. Taking this a step further, we estimated the participants who may be in poverty in a food desert or a transit desert by seeing if the population lies within these areas. For low-income areas, I was able to use ESRI's Living Atlas to find the most current ACS data that showed poverty status, so there was no manipulation of data needed. Same with food deserts. I didn't have to do calculations to determine food deserts because this had already been determined by the United States Department of Agriculture. Areas are a food desert if at least 500 people or 33% of the population are living more than one mile in urban areas or 10 miles in rural areas from the nearest supermarket, supercenter, or large grocery store. The bulk of my work was identifying transit deserts. Much like food deserts signifying the gap between supply, grocery stores, and demand, residents, transit deserts signify the gap between supply, or the ways to get around, and demand, the transit-dependent residents. The supply or transit service was determined by four criteria. The number of bus and rail stops, the frequency of service for each bus and rail stop per day, the number of routes, and the length of bike routes and sidewalks. The demand or transit dependent population is based on disparities between automobile drivers and automobiles available. So areas with large disparities between the two are more likely to be transit dependent than areas that have nearly a one-to-one -one ratio of cars to people. There are a lot of nuances to calculate this number, but once it was created, it was standardized and then compared to the supply number to determine the excess or lack of supply. By running this analysis in 2018 and comparing it to 2021, in the comparable area, we see that 412 Food Rescue greatly expanded its reach to serve high-risk populations. This increase in high-risk individuals reached is due to deliberate efforts to onboard more nonprofit organizations in the high-risk areas identified in the 2018 study and increase the frequency and volume of food donations to these partners. Between 2018 and 2021, the total population reached by 412 food rescue partner sites, food donation recipient organizations, increased by almost 100,000 individuals. Overall, 412 food rescue improved its reach into every type of vulnerable population over the past three years. The research also identified 16 new high risk areas to focus partnerships and programming. So now that I've showed you all of this, what should you do now? Think about how you want to frame your impact. Do you want to evaluate what you've been doing or perhaps forecast the value you're creating for the future? What is your organization focused on? I wrote some examples of things you can quantify to show your impact on your community or the world. Next, familiarize yourself with what this analysis could mean. For example, this study that I described is very spatial and location-based in nature, and it utilizes walk sheds. So if you think walk sheds should be used in your analysis, you would want to get a data analyst that is familiar with Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. And depending on this analysis, find someone who can work with you to understand your goals and scope your projects. You can research and review possible methods of data analysis that are replicable. So the optimal background would be in data science, GIS, or statistics. In terms of replicability, you would, if you want to use different analysts each time an update needs to happen, good documentation would be necessary to make sure that the same data sources are used, for example. Likewise, they should have access to and know how to use non-proprietary analysis tools to keep it replicable. Since I'm a GIS professional for this project, I primarily use ArcGIS Pro for analysis using walk sheds, intersections, merges, and joins. Some of the calculations involve field calculator. 
This person should also have access to authoritative data sets like the U.S. Census, Esri's Living Atlas, etc. to find things like transit routes, sidewalks, poverty, population. And this person should also be able to translate jargon into materials digestible for the public. For this project, I use Esri Story Maps as a user-friendly visual companion to the Ritter Report. If you're on a budget, make sure to look for these people in your existing volunteer base. You could distribute a volunteer survey to create a skills matrix for your volunteers, including skills even beyond data analysis, like fundraising, marketing, and design. You may be pleasantly surprised at what sort of things can be brought to the table. Look at your local civic tech groups where you could find like-minded techie people, or local universities with data analysis programs. Professors love using real problems for their students. Students may scope your project and perform analysis for a class grade. Or organizations like the Data Science for Social Good. You can send a problem statement in and then the organization would pair you with volunteers. And if you have money to spend, you can always create an RFP and hire someone. But what's amazing is that the mission statement of food rescue is so powerful that I bet it would be hard not to find someone to work on this. And the eventual dream for this impact report is to make this analysis process automated, aut updating with every data change to the partners or to transit schedule changes, to census data sets. And this way we can calculate trends and see patterns. There's so much more I could dive into, but I think my 10 minutes is up. So feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Here's the QR code to the story map I created for this analysis. Thanks for your time and good luck with your own analysis. That was so great. And the research that she did for us at 412 Food Rescue, we've been able, able to leverage that over and over again because it just really demonstrates the impact that um, the food rescue organization in Pittsburgh has had here on um, increasing access. And so again, it's that question of um, what can your data show you and how can you demonstrate impact beyond weight? Um, now I want to introduce um, Dr. Katie Greeno, who is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, um, who also did some great research for 412 Food Rescue. We're really lucky to have all these amazing researchers here at our university that have been excited to, um, to help us out. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, and if you want to give a little bit more info about um, your background and who you are, that'd be great. And maybe that's in your presentation. <laughs> Your mic's off. But on it. On it. I was trying to share at the same time, which was why I was not seeing it. Um, should I, um, I'll share my screen, is that okay? Um, actually, I think that Patrick is ready to share your screens, your slides, he's got them up and can just do them for you. Okay, super. So um, I'm Katie Greeno. I'm on the faculty at um, the School of Social Work at the University of Pittsburgh, and it's been such a privilege to be able to work with 412 Food Rescue, and I'm really excited to share with you a very um, easy entry, low cost um, way that you can consider uh, measuring your impact. Um, so um, if we go to the first slide. Um, as everybody on this call, I'm sure knows, um, there's many, many benefits to food rescue. Um, there's the reduction of food waste. Um, eating fresh food, which is perishable and needs to be redistributed, can improve people's diet. Um, in the United States, diet, there are many health problems associated with uh, poor quality nutrition and overnutrition of foods that are not fresh. Um, people can get budget relief and um, also build community through food sharing and food distribution. And also very importantly, a goal is to reduce food insecurity. But it's been challenging to measure anything other than um, pounds of food distributed, as Jen was saying earlier on. So if we can get the next slide. Um, what we did together is we developed a short, easy to administer survey. 
Um, it has two sections. The first section is recipient reported impact. And the second section is a modification of the USDA food insecurity questionnaire that can be used after people have started re um, receiving food. So what we wanted to do was um, just find out if people were um, starting out, you know, just like if you redistribute food, but people don't eat it, then you haven't reduced food waste. Um, and so uh, a very straightforward um, technique for finding out is just to ask people if they if they use the food. Um, and so we designed the questionnaire so it could examine impact and estimate the impact 412 is having and also can be used for quality improvement both in terms of um, impact, if there's areas of impact that could be um, improved, and also just how satisfied people are with the, with the um, food deliveries. So next slide, please. So um, just to talk about how we um, developed the survey, we interviewed food rescue experts and community stakeholders, as well as food recipients to identify the domains. And we've already showed you the domains that we were targeting. And then we developed test items and we um, developed a like a 20 item survey about, and then we did cognitive interviews with food recipients where they just um, did a think aloud um, process while they, um, answered the questions just to make sure that people were understanding them the way we expected them to. And we finalized a 12 item questionnaire that had to do with recipient reported impact. So that's section one, because then there's also another five or six items. So the whole thing is under 20 items. So each of the 12 statements um, has four response items, strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll start to see what the items are what the domains are. So these were our domains, um, were to reduce food waste, improve the healthfulness of diet, Im improve finances and reduce stress. And quality assurance domains are satisfaction and um, fairness. Fairness came directly from our participants um, because where food is being distributed across many different sites, um, it turned out that that was a big issue for people, um, whether or not they felt like they were getting um, the best food that was being redistributed or if they felt like they were at the end of the line, you know, that was something that was really important to them in terms of their perceptions of the food rescue. So can we get the next slide, please? Um, and so here, I just in the next couple of slides are showing you what the items are. And um, I, I uh, actually didn't think to put my email on this, um, but I'm very easy to find um, if you Google me and I'll be sure to say my email and um, maybe I can type it in the chat and people can see it. I'm not sure. Um, but um, these, I was just going to go over what the items are. So you see them and um, I'll just do like one from each domain. Um, the, the, one of the first domains is just literally do they actually use the food because that's so important in terms of actually reducing food waste. And then in their improving healthfulness, we just ask, you know, because of 412 Food Rescue, I eat healthier food. Um, going to the next domain, food provided to me helps me make ends meet. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm less stressed, I'm more connected with my community, and then I'm satisfied with the food, I'm satisfied with the variety of food, and food um, is distributed fairly. So those are the 12 items that we have on the questionnaire. And if we can go to the next slide. This is what it looks like um, on, you know, when it's typed up. So that's not all of the items, but, and there's a, a little bit that we didn't, I didn't go over in detail. Um, you know, it's easy for me to find out how to use food, and then we ask them how they, how the, um, how they uh, use food if they're unfamiliar with it. So next slide, please. Um, we also um, there's a uh, one of the really important impacts is to reduce food insecurity, 
And food insecurity has very well established longstanding measurement that is put out by the USDA food insecurity, uh, um, that's put out by the USDA. Um, and I have a link there, but it's just really easy. If you ever want to find it, just go to USDA food insecurity measurement and you can see the history of their measurement. And then they have some different versions of these items. But, um, and um, for our international participants, um, I'd just like to uh, be sure to mention that, you know, this applies primarily to the United States, but I would expect that it would be able to translate in an international, um, the, the technique that we use to modify these could be used, adapted in an international context. Um, so we decided that it was too hard to measure before donations begin. So it would be really great is if you're adding new area, you know, you're adding a new, um, location where you're distributing food. And if you have community relations where people would fill out surveys for you, you could do a pretest and just use the USDA food insecurity and just measure before and after, which would be terrific. Um, it's pretty hard. Um, I don't have a lot of focus on this, but it, any anybody who's been involved in um, community-based survey work, especially now, like there's just so many opportunities, you know, you get so many asks to fill out surveys, people don't always want to do it. Um, so it's, we decided we wanted something that you could use um, after um, food distribution already started, because then you have this strong relationship with the community because you're providing something really important to them. And so they're more willing to want to help you out. So for each USDA um, food insecurity item, we set up the question so that people reported it's self-reported change and you know there's definitely problems with asking for self-report but on the other hand it is you know a, a legitimate to have, way to try to estimate you know whether these things changed so for each item we ask do food deliveries and then we'd say the food insecurity item and then we'd say do they help a little uh, help a lot help a little make no difference make this worse or this has never happened to me. So those were the um, options that we decided. And again, you're very, very welcome. Anybody who wants to, we'd love it if you wanted to use our survey. And if you were in the United States context, you could use it with the food insecurity items, but you could change the response items if you felt like there were others that were a better fit for you. So can we get the next slide, please? Um, so this is um, what it looked like. It would say, here are some things that can happen to people. Have food deliveries changed this for you? The food I bought just didn't last and I didn't have the money to buy more. So that is an item from the USDA food insecurity um, survey measure. And then we had those response items and then we had it for all those, uh, for those five items. And that was how we estimated change in food insecurity. Next slide, please. And this is what it looked like in the you know copy of the survey that we used. Um, next slide. Um, and I just wanted to say that we surveyed about 300 recipients of food, more than 300 recipients of food, and um, 412 is highly impactful. Um, and so you know there were wonderful results for this excellent organization in our local community. And when you think about how you might be able to measure this in your area too. Um, you know, it was, it was very encouraging um, how positive were people were towards food um, deliveries. So the, the focus of this presentation is more on introducing the, um, the survey technique that we use, but I just wanted to tell you that we had great results. <laughs> so next slide, please. <laughs> um, and then I, I wanted to talk a little bit about if you, do, if you were to decide that you wanted to administer it and um, uh, I, we, I could do a whole session on the, you know, tips and tricks for doing community-based survey work. Um, but everything you think about it, all the common sense things, you're absolutely on track. So a couple of things, again, speaking more to the American context, um, in the United States, you would not need human subjects clearance. Um, some people might be concerned about that. Um, 
survey research, um, people consent by completing it and a survey like this one can't damage people's um, reputations or insurability. So there's no, it's a quality assurance survey and you, it's very unlikely that you would need IRB clearance if you wanted to do it yourselves without university support or, you know, the support of a professional evaluator. Um, the best practices um, for, for um, consenting people are to just tell them what is the purpose, how, what do they have to do to participate, that there's no penalty for refusing. That's, I think, one of the big cornerstones that we really wanted to emphasize. Yeah. And, and then you can tell them how you protect their identity. And can we go to the next slide? Um, this just shows, um, well, this, this shows how we did it. And then the next slide just shows what it looked like on that. We did it as a cover sh sheet to the survey. So, um, you know, so this is the purpose. We want to know what you think. Um, this is what you have to do. Would you please fill it out? And then this next part, um, it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. You can skip any part of it. Your food deliveries are not affected by your participation or by your answers. And in our case, it was anonymous. So we were like, we don't take any names. We don't take any identifying information. You know, you can look at the sheet and see that there's no identifying information. So it's anonymous. You could choose a confidential um, approach, but you know, but so it's, it's very, it's just, you know, it's reassuring to people. So we didn't do any analyses like did women like it better than men or anything, anything like that. So um, that's a, you know, that's a way to um, feel really confident that you're being respectful of the people who you're asking to participate without feeling the need to go, you know, get a consent form or, you know, go to a, a federally sanctioned body for approval or anything like that. So survey research is very widely understood as being people consent just by completing it. So I wanted to be sure people knew that they were going to be fine if they wanted to use it, uh, go ahead and use it themselves. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so um, I, I wanted to say, if you want to do this, um, like a, an optional thing is to connect with somebody with experience with evaluation. That's just great. And um, uh, Jen and I were talking about this in preparation for the um, for this session. And, um, you know, I just really, and I thought that um, Melinda's um, recommendations about how to connect with people were excellent. Just like, you know, network and everywhere you go say, we want to do a survey. Do you think anybody would want to help us? <laughs> And like, you know, professors are often looking for data. Um, mm -hmm. uh, students often need projects and you can get help, um, you know, doing it. And so what, if you decide to do it uh, with your own staff or with um, support, um, just on the one hand, it's not a difficult procedure. On the other hand, it's easy to um, I don't know, just get there without pens or something that you really need. <laughs> so just like put the effort into planning it, devote staff time the, on survey collection days, have some staff who aren't doing anything else, just like announcing it and explaining it to anybody who has questions and sitting in a quiet corner with somebody who wants help filling it out. Just like be sure that you devote staff time to it. And that's probably your primary cost um, is the staff time that it would take. Um, so, you know, just, just think it through um, how it would work. This survey would absolutely translate very, very easily to um, Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey or something people could do on their phone. You can get a QR code and they could complete it on their phone and then you don't even have to enter it into a spreadsheet. Um, so um, if, if it uh, it's it's a it's a really easy technology to use, um, and if you get a little bit of help, do a you know a little bit of put a little bit of thought into the staffing you need for it, you'd be able to do it, really no problem. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I think we've already talked about this. I, I guess the only other thing I'd like to add about how you can connect with people is if you have a, I'm a faculty member in the School of Social Work here at Pitt. And if you, and, and again, this is the American context and it could be different internationally. 
but in the United States, social work students um, are required to be in field placement for 24 hours a week their second year. So it's a lot of time and they have to do projects. Um, so they have to take a research class, which is usually a project class. And so if you have a social worker on your staff who's qualified to um, serve as a field placement supervisor, um, you can get somebody who could be a lot of help. They'll learn a lot about food rescue um, and not just for this, but for all kinds of things that they would learn about your organization and about food waste, food waste and food rescue. Um, and they would could definitely be exactly the kind of support you would want if you wanted to do, you know, two weeks of survey collection, you could just put them in charge of it and they could do it, they could do it. <laughs> so if you can connect with the social work, uh, you, if, you know, if you have any social workers on your staff, you can see if your local school of social work, they, are, they may already be a field instructor or they could become a field instructor and you could work with a, a social work field placement student. Um, next slide. So just following up on the takeaways, um, this is a short, easy to use survey. It's available for free. Um, I would love to figure out how to just like do a small website and, you know, or um, 412 Food Rescue um, you, is welcome to post it. Jen, if you want to post it, you should. <laughs> yeah. could just, okay, good. So you can just download it and use it. Um, you're welcome to use it in um, any way that, um, that works for you. Um, you can, it's easy to administer yourself if you think that it would help you document your effectiveness um, or you can look for assistance as we were um, discussing. And if you employ a social worker, you may be able to get um, student help in that way. So it's just a real privilege to be here and to be involved with this work. And I'm just so impressed with the virtual conference. And so um, that concludes my presentation. I'd just like to say thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katie. We have a lot of questions. Before we get to that, I just wanted to say that our third member, um, Grace Clare, she's in New Zealand and we've had some struggles figuring out the time zone. I think maybe um, that or some technical difficulties have uh, prevented her from being here today. We're kind of hoping she'll jump in the end, but she can talk a little bit about some of the issues brought up. She's actually a PhD student and she did research for the um, uh, Food Rescue Alliance in New Zealand. Um, as part of her doctoral work. Um, and so, like you said, finding students, um, master students, doctoral students that need projects to, um, to finish their degree can be a really great boon to both of you. It's a real win-win um, relationship. There's some other um, questions in the chat, but first, before I get to those, I do wanna say that, um, Katie, if you email me the PDF, we will attach that to this session. So okay, the, um, anybody that's here, you can go into the session, um, you know, sometime within the next couple hours and it will be downloadable. Um, also, this website will be uh, accessible and the recording will be up for people um, to go back and look at if they wanted to, you know, you know, listen to something that caught their attention. Um, and that'll be available to everybody who's registered for the conference. And so will the downloads be available. Um, so a couple of questions that were asked um, were, um, let's see, here we go. Were there incentives offered for completing a survey? No. Um, we just said, um, you know, so we conducted it at sites where um, uh, mostly um, publicly funded housing where there were communities of people living, um, you know, in a single neighborhood and there would be like food, pretty well established food delivery days about once a month. And so after those were well established, we would just go and say like, um, you know, so glad you're here. Um, we have a survey that you can fill out to help us out. You don't have to do it. And people were really generous about, about filling it out. Um, incentives are, are great. They're just really complicated to come up with the money and administer. And then like, how do you hand over all the gift cards? And, you know, they're just, there's, yeah, it's hard to administer. Not, not only is it an additional cost, but it's also hard to administer and for, us, it was not necessary in order to get very good 
um, response rates, very good participation. Yeah, we, I believe we actually discussed that early on and we thought, well, let's give it a try and see what the response rate is. And somebody asked what the response rate was. And I wanted to add before I get to that is that we did this with volunteers. We recruited volunteers um, to help us collect the surveys. We gave them some pretty um, pretty solid training. It was a, we had everybody go through, I wouldn't say extensive training, it was maybe an hour or two, but um, really informed by uh, Katie's, um, you know, uh, the, the things that she read that you have to read this um, information to them. It's okay if they don't wanna fill it out, they need to know that their ability to receive food is not gonna be impacted by whether or not they answer the survey, how to help people uh, fill out the survey, how to not lead them into answers, um, and so on. So we we used volunteers that we trained, and then we went out to these sites on days that we had um, distributions, and people were really happy to to fill them out. Um, they were it was something to do while they were waiting, <laughs> um, and they were more than happy. We have a really good relationship with our partners and with the people that we serve um, in the communities that we serve. Um, that's something that we've worked really hard to foster, and so most of them were like, "Oh, four one two, absolutely, I'd love." to fill this out you guys are great um and um, also i just want to say part of that does come from when we do have somebody that's unhappy we take that seriously and respect that um, and work through those issues with them um katie i had a question for you so we had about 300 um responses and uh which was great um but i wanted to talk about that because for people who maybe aren't in the research field, what is a good number of responses? What's too low? What's you know what's ideal? I was worried that that wouldn't be enough at the time, but we got some really um, good statistically significant responses. Um, I think that like the limiting case, I I can't really think of a number that's too low. I mean, I I think if you are I. I'm not as familiar with what what the wide range of situations people might be in. Most of the um, organizations that I'm familiar with distribute to a lot of people. And certainly any organization that is estimating their impact by doing pounds of food redistributed probably is serving a lot of people. But say that you had a really small number of people. I mean, this is like 17, 18 questions. They can fill them out and you can summarize them and you can see what they say. We also had on the back page, um, we just added lines to a blank page and said, what's something you wish we were doing differently and what's the best thing you get from this? And so if you really are only serving 10 people or something, you could choose to interview them and you know, just like have a focus group and just talk to them in a you know, slightly more structured way. But there really isn't a size that's too small. Um, if you were going to, you know, write a report and put it on your website, I would think you would want 30, 30 people or something like that. If you have much, many fewer than 30 people, it might look a little odd to people. You might not feel like it's worth your time. But I would think that most organizations would easily be able to do that. And we worked with 17 or 18 distribution sites as well. And so, you know, it was a a lot of a lot of people and a, a varied varied population so we yeah. um we hit a lot of different types of distribution sites whether it was family or senior disability so we tried to get a wide range of our partners um, and that free answer space, we got some really good data, including some things that people didn't like that we could fix, um, and also some really great um, qualitative data about what we were doing well and what they liked. And that stuff is is great for funders, to be honest. You know, that's the type of stuff that you can take to a foundation and say, look, this is this is what the people that we serve think about our efforts, and this is how it's enriching their life or helping them. And and that's really important. It 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 gives the the you know the data behind the mission um now I, I have another question for you katie um so i've also had people say well you're giving them food of course they're going to give you a positive response and i know um back when we did this we talked a little bit about that and you had some um information you've done a lot of surveys or there's a lot of people that do surveys at point of service and um can you talk a little bit about that 
Um, it is absolutely true that satisfaction surveys tend to skew very positive. Like it's just, it's painful to people to say that they hate you and they will, if typically they won't reply instead of, you know, instead of filling out something that they hate the whole oh, thing. Oh, we did some vocal folks. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know, there are limitations with every methodology and a limitation of a self-report methodology is that it isn't the same. If you ask people if they eat all the food, it's not the same as going and actually measuring, weighing the food before and after or observing if they really, if they really eat it. But it's, pretty good and people will like giving people an opportunity to give you feedback about what you wish they would do differently they will and there were a few people who said that they really didn't like anything about it yeah there were and there were people that said they didn't eat all the food yeah know? oh yeah yeah uh, i mean every question had a range of responses and you know people who said like i just wouldn't touch that kind of foot, food with a 10 foot pole along with the people who said like i've gotten to try exotic foods that I would never have dreamed of even existed. Yes, and, absolutely. I mean, it is true that people are likely to say that they like it, but I think that it's that's because it's true that people actually do like it. I mean, they're getting very high quality food um, that they would have great difficulty accessing otherwise. Yeah, I know that I was actually really, um, I was actually relieved to see some negative responses because that gave me some confidence that people were willing to to tell the truth, that it was anonymous, that they were um, willing to, you know, be real, be honest and say, you know, it's too much lettuce or <laughs> I don't like right. that, food, you know, right. um, or I, I, I just don't use it all. It's too much. So. And I was just so interested to learn, um, which we learned a lot from the interview study that we did when we were developing the items, um, that even if people get very large quantities of food that they don't, that aren't necessarily their favorites, they talked about how they used every scrap of food. So if they got three heads of cabbage, they cooked it up and froze it and had a big party with their neighbors and they ate three heads of cabbage. I mean, it was like, it was amazing. We got so much great information. There was actually one quote I remember. It, it was probably along the lines of the cabbage where somebody was saying that um, they would uh, cook up food for the neighborhood um, and that, that, that if there was somebody in the neighborhood that didn't know how to cook something, you know, they would take it and they would cook it for them. Um, and so they were sort of uh, working together as a community to make sure that um, everybody had access to this food, regardless of their skill or their abilities. Um, and that kind of data, that kind of information about what's actually happening when you deliver the food um, is so powerful and so important. And it really gave us a much deeper understanding of what it means to bring food, especially really fresh, high quality food into a community. And I was really interested to learn, too, how many good cooks there are in those communities. So I think that one thing donor communities often think like, well, maybe cooking classes or distributing recipes or setting up a kitchen. But there were really expert cooks in the communities who would be able to, because it's a whole system of storing the food until you can prepare it. And they were very... Uh, systematic and mindful about it. So they were like, okay, first we eat the lettuce because that doesn't keep as long. And then, you know, eventually we get to the meat where we've been able to freeze it and we cook it up and then, you know, refreeze it cooked and we have a big neighborhood party. And it was yeah. really impressive. Or the one woman said, you know, we have taco salads. We always plan for taco salads for dinner the day the uh, food rescue shows up. Um, a question, I just want to get to some of the questions on the side here. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please make sure to drop them inside. If you have qu questions about the GIS survey, um, I worked with the Melinda and the team when that, that was happening as well, so I can probably answer some questions on that. Um, the food, uh, Swedberg asked, uh, is it safe to assume the more organizations offering and providing free rescued food in the communities um, are better than one? Absolutely. Um, we really, uh, we focus on new distribution centers. That, that was what the GIS study was measuring is um, when we work with housing sites and um, um, Head Start programs and veterans programs and all of these uh, sites that are not food distribution locations, but they're serving people who are food insecure. Um, that's what increases access. And that's really important. Um, we've shown that it 
uh, can tr it basically transforms the food system to take that fresh food and find new avenues for distribution. It addresses all sorts of limitations, you know, time, transportation, um, uh, you know, living in a food desert, as well as sort of the traditional barrier to food security, which is financial. Um, are there other questions? Katie, do you have anything else to add? Um, just that I uh, really appreciate being part of this community and the um, thoughtfulness um, the importance of the work and the thoughtfulness with which the work is pursued and the service that's provided to our communities, to all the members of our communities, the people who receive food, but the people who don't have to waste food as well, the organizations that don't have to um, waste food and the environment, the potential for environmental impact as well as the social good that's done is um, so meaningful to so many people in this community and it's a real privilege to be here. So. I just want to say thanks. Yeah, there was a question, um, which I will end on, about what the relationship is between 412 Food Rescue and the faculty at Pitt, um, and how did we partner on these excellent research projects? And I mean, honestly, it is, like you said, getting out in the community, talking to people, um, finding faculty that you know in uh, departments that might have some relevant interest, um, just everywhere you go, and on social media, talking about the type of questions that you want to ask. Are there people that are interested in doing research in this field? Um, we've had some um, data grad students, uh, data analysis grad students come in and do some work for us. And I mean, there's really no end to the number of um, grad students and even professors who are excited and interested to do this work. So just getting out there and don't be afraid to ask. What's the worst that'll happen? They'll say no. But most of them are get, might say, oh, let me think about that. I might know somebody else that can help you. Um, so it's really, uh, it's, a, it's a great resource to have a university in your um, community. But I wanna note, Melinda, she works for Allegheny County. She's a GIS specialist with the county. So there's, there's professionals out there all over the place, not just in um, higher uh, education. Well, uh, it's the end of a long day. Total words failed me. Uh, like universities, I said higher education and sort of trailed off into nothing. So yeah, absolutely, Ab absolutely. And I think that the um, the expertise that um, that Melinda brought with the um, you know the many sort forms and sources of data is just really exciting. And I think if you're willing to you know be willing to have some. Um, you know, dates that don't turn into relationships, like maybe they come to your spaces and you really don't like them. <laughs> or maybe they're really pushy or they have to do things only in one way. And maybe you can tolerate that and you'll get something cool out of it. Or maybe you don't want to, you know, it's like, a, you know, being willing to tolerate their eccentricities and figure out their relationship. What part of it do they need to drive so they can get a publication or, you know, something that they need for Allegheny County, you know, report or something. And what parts of it can you drive? It's, definitely it's definitely doable especially in this information you know digital era there was one last question um, from charlie burns um how best to reach out to universities if you haven't worked with them previously um i have thoughts on this but uh katie do you want to go ahead and offer i your was really curious to hear to hear jen i don't i, I think i've kind of said what i have to say sure. so. i think i'm gonna echo some of what you said um, most of us, most of our communities, even in big cities, are actually pretty small. Um, if you don't know somebody at the university, somebody else does. So just start talking about it. Post on your social media and say, I'm interested in looking for some researchers at the local university that might be interested in looking into um, answering these questions um, or into doing research on the impact of uh, food recovery. Um, and just getting it out there to as many contexts as possible, and you'll find them. Now, you can certainly reach out cold to a professor um, or a, a department. I would actually call the department, not, not an individual professor, and say I'm interested in this sort of research area who works on it, um, and start there and maybe get that, uh, that, that narrowed down a little bit to somebody who might really have an interest in that. But um, in general, just leverage your contacts. 
I, yeah. I guarantee you, you are one to two degrees away from a uh, somebody who knows somebody in academia. Yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing. I think you're just closer than you think. Like, it's very likely that you know students at the university. And if you talk to the students, they'll introduce you to professors. And, you know, the professors, if they can't do it themselves or it's not their area, they'll have an idea of something you can do. Like, just any kind of networking you can do digitally if they're having talks in person again, if you just want to like go to some talks and introduce yourself. Um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of interest in trying to do more impactful work. I mean, I think the universities are feeling very keenly that they don't, you know, they don't want to be the angels on the head of the pin. You know, they want to be able to be doing something about the serious problems that we're facing. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm sure there's, um, a couple of departments that make sense to work with, um, you know, Public social health. Health, yeah. Public health departments, um, uh, data science, data programs. science, policy, social work. Yep. Uh, environmental studies, business, food, yeah. business, GIS. I mean, really, there, there's no end of of um, academic areas that this doesn't sort of reach into. Well, with that, I want to say thank you so much to Katie. I want to make a announcement. Um, I'm going to, um, once I, I hear from Grace, I'm going to also upload her research here. It is really interesting, and I urge everybody to take a look at um, nutrition and food science. Absolutely. Um, and then I want to remind folks, there's a breakout session at 5 and then at 7 o'clock Eastern. Um, we are having a um, exclusive screening of the film, The Interceptors, which looked at um, sort of the the ecosystem of food diversion um, in or food waste diversion, I should say, in um, Vancouver. And there'll be a panel discussion after that. So if you're on the East Coast, you know, go get something to eat take your shoes off, relax, and come back for that. If you're on the West Coast, that'll still be in your, uh, you know, in the scope of your day. You can go ahead and we are uploading the recordings of this morning's sessions to the um, their, their spot on the agenda. So if you click on the agenda, you'll find a recording of those sessions. Um, or we're working on uploading them. I'm not sure if we've gotten all the way through those yet or not, but we're working on it. So um, if you miss the morning ones, you can catch up on those before the film. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. And um, this is it for me today. There's more happening, but I will be back here tomorrow morning and um, enjoy the rest of the day. And I will see everyone tomorrow. Thank you so much. And congratulations on this very successful conference, Jim. Well, thank you. We couldn't do it without out all of our amazing speakers and, of course, the people that are asking great questions and um, watching online. So uh, thanks, everyone. Bye.